Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to wait for a few minutes for everyone to join us. Um, I see Parag is online. We'll just wait for a few more minutes to get everybody on board, and then I will invite our guest of honor for tonight's episode. And then here we go. Barack, you have to accept my request. Just waiting for Barack to connect. Here you go. Well, well. Hello, well, well, Barack. Well, How are well. you? How are you? Good. You're looking fabulous, as always. Well, so is you. <laughs> I can see that you set your hair properly, you know? <laughs> Why don't I? Uh, okay, I think I'm in a good position now. I think the light behind me was uh, was too bright, but now is perfect. It's perfect, you okay? And I can hear you perfect, and it's wonderful. Well, it's an honor to have you. I will basically say just a bit of a um, kind of uh, logistical things. I will do. It, I will say a few words about the conversations with Olga. Then I will uh, do a short bio of you. Uh, I will do the condensed version because I can talk for hours just to, <laughs> just to line, you know, just to tell about your accomplishments and everything. And then we'll just dive in all together with some of the exciting uh, points and questions. Hopefully we can cover some of them, if not most. Can't wait. Okay. okay. Well, I assume that a lot of people have joined in. So it's one minute after eight. And... Good evening, everyone. Good evening, our friends in Singapore. Good afternoon, everybody in Europe. And uh, good morning for some of the early risers in the United States. And uh, welcome to Conversations with Olga uh, that I started during the um, circuit breaker because I had more time and, uh, I, and I wanted to connect to incredible people. Uh, around the world. It's an IGTV uh, series fostering intellectual and cultural exchange between influential individuals from all over the world. These individuals, my friends, share their life story in hopes to uh, inspire and cultivate a more diverse and inclusive community. Uh, it's, tonight is my 10th episode and uh, if you can listen to all the episodes if you go on IGTV at events by Olga and press conversation session and um, you can listen to all these incredible, wonderful people. And tonight, this is my honor to welcome my dear friend, Dr. Parak Khanna. I will tell, <laughs> I will tell a few words about you, but I'm sure everybody knows, but nevertheless, I have to present you properly. Parak is a leading global strategy advisor, world traveler, and best-selling author. His internationally best-selling books have been translated to more than 20 languages. Parak was named one of the Esquire's 75 most influential people in the 21st century. He had featured in Wired Magazine's Smart List. From 2013 to 2018, he was a senior research fellow in the Center on Asia and Globalization at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore. Prior to that, from 2006 to 2015, he was a senior research fellow at the New American Foundation. He has held a variety of senior positions in the U.S. government, such as an advisor to the U.S. National Intelligence Council and served in Iraq and Afghanistan as a senior uh, intelligence consul and uh, served in Iraq and Afghanistan, sorry, served in Iraq and Afghanistan as senior geopolitical advisor to the United States Special Operations Forces. He's also been a fellow in the Brookings, Brookings Insti Institution and worked in the World Economic Forum and Council on Foreign Relations. Dr. Barak Khanna also appears frequently in media all around the world, from BBC to CNN and has been given two major TED Talks that I thoroughly enjoyed listening to, and he, was viewed, he is viewed by more than 3 million um, people. 
The maps customized for his books have been displayed in numerous prestigious international art exhibitions. Parag's company Future Map is frequently called to provide strategic guidance to governments all over the world, such as US, Canada, Germany, the UAE, Japan, and Singapore. Parag holds a PhD of international relations from the London School of Economics and a bachelor's and master's degree from the School of Foreign Services in Georgetown University. Barak was born in India and grew up in United Arab Emirates, New York, and Germany. He is an accomplished adventurer who has traveled to nearly 150 countries to all, on all continents. Since uh, some of his lengthy journey include driving from the Baltic Sea through the Balkan and across Turkey and the Caucasus to the Caspian Sea, across the rugged terrain of Tibet and Xinjiang, provinces of Western China, and 10,000 kilometers from London to Alan Batur and the Mongolia charity, for the, in the Mongolia, Mongolia charity rally, am I correct? Uh, I saw the documentary that Parak showed me a few years ago about some of his um, travels and it's fascinating. Um, uh, he, was, he climbed numerous 20,000 foot plus peaks all over, including Alps and Himalayas and Sanshan mountain ranges. And he's also a very competitive tennis player, among other physical activities that he does regularly. He speaks German, Hindi, French, Spanish, and uh, basic Arabic. And he can communicate a little bit when he has enough vodka in Russian. And uh, I witnessed that in some, at some of my dinners at home. Well, once again, dear Farak, thank you so much for joining us and welcome. Uh, we have to dive in immediately and we have a lot of uh, things to cover. And so I would like to start with your books. Your life is extremely full, diverse, incredibly uh, exciting. And uh, your interests of world travel and economics uh, really have been an inspiration to all of us, to my children, to your listeners to friends from all over the world and uh, please I, I want to start with your new book that I'm thoroughly enjoying reading it's the future of ASEAN uh, you talk about getting Asia right what does it mean well first of all thank you Olga it's such a pleasure to be with you I'm honored to be your 10th uh, guest and we've been in Singapore almost 10 years. And uh, really, you know, you in particular have made us feel like family here. So I'm uh, thrilled yeah. to, uh, beyond all of our informal get togethers, to have this conversation with you. So congratulations on uh, everything you've been doing and now moving into the, the digital domain. Um, so on this uh, book, you know, it's appropriate that we're in Singapore because one of the, the many arguments in this book is that a place like Singapore not only represents the future of Asia, this city is something like a capital of Asia because it really brings together as in a melting pot way the people from Northeast Asia, North Asia, like China, of course, uh, South Asia, Indians, and of course, people from all across South, uh, Southeast Asia. So this is really the story of the last 30 years. Well, you know, it was exactly 30 years ago, guys, you know, uh, as well as anyone that the Soviet Union collapsed. So that was 1991. Here we are in 2021. And the history of the world from in our conventional Anglo-centric English language Western media is told through the lens of what happened to the West of the last 30 years, right? Western exactly. policies, everything. But the truth is that the biggest story of the last 30 years and the biggest story of the next 30 years is right here in Asia. Because by far the biggest story of this entire time period has been the rise of Asia. Not Trump, not Brexit, uh, none of those things, right? Simply, it's the rise of Asia. It's Asian societies getting more connected to each other, with uh, China, of course, rising the fastest and most powerfully, but now a whole other wave of countries rising as well. So this collective Asian story is the one that I wanted to tell, not only because we need an Asian history of this post-war, post-Cold War period, but also because we need a history and a, and a forecast that's not only about China, 
because as you know, there are 3.5 billion Asians who are not Chinese, right? And I wanted to tell an integrated story. Got it. Yes, and actually, uh, I love the crash course in world history in your book. Uh, it's really fascinating. It's written with the notion that the 20, 21st century, as you said, is the world is being Asianized, isn't it? Um, you all talk about getting Asia right. What does it mean? That's a, that's a great question. So getting Asia right is a very topical, a timely uh, issue to, to discuss because it is something that the Biden administration is facing as well, right, to, to rethink what its Asia policy is. But of course, the book is not directed just at people in Washington. It's actually directed at people in Asia because a lot of, uh, you know, Asia is so vast. There are six or seven major civilizational groups. They don't all understand each other particularly well either. What I've noticed over the last 10 years is that Chinese don't know Indian history. Indians don't know Japanese history. Japanese don't know Indonesian history. Indonesians don't know Persian history. And I wanted to, like you say, give a crash course, you know, a neutral perspective on the last 4,000 years of Asian history in 50 yeah. pages so that anyone from any part of Asia or anywhere in the world could agree that this is what happened. This is what yeah. history was. You know, not from a Chinese view or a Japanese view or a Korean view, but a holistic kind of perspective of really that you can't explain any Asian civilization without looking at the others and how yes. they have connected. So that's part of what getting Asia right is. And the other part of it is, of course, not looking at only China and believing that Asia is whatever China wants, yeah. because that's not true. True of the past, it's not true of the present, and it's not true of the future. So Asia is, as I like to say, not a block, it's a sponge, right? It's a sponge historically, and it's ever more a sponge today. Yes. Absolutely, and you know, you're right that Asia is rapidly returning actually to the century old patterns of commerce and conflict and cultural exchange from time before European colonization and American dominance to some extent, isn't it? What is your take on cultural transformation in Asia? Of course, you know, I'm, I'm always very interested in traditions mm -hmm. and culture. And is there is an emphasis of going back in the traditions and heritage and rather than complete immersion into the technology driven and obscure at times, um, the sort of obscure time right. for the global civilizations? What do you... It's it a great on? point. You know, fortunately, the answer is that the rise of Asia has come with a restoration of the centrality of certain Asian cultural legacies. But let, let me go back, because in the 1990s, people thought, well, when Asia modernizes, it might just come to look like the West. And that school of thought was modernization equals Westernization. That proved not to be true. The, one of the other arguments was, well, everything becomes technology, right? And we all lose our culture. That's also not true. So what we've seen now is that whether it is um, uh, Chinese fashion and, and music and art, and you know, obviously Chinese artists are among the most prominent in the world today, or if we think about um, uh, Ayurvedic uh, Indian medicine and uh, you know, the popularity of Indian spices and cooking and Bollywood dance, you name it, right? Yes. I wanted to actually, what, one of the things I did, and this was a tedious uh, exercise, I went back over the last 100 years and I looked at how many Asians each decade have won Nobel prizes or film awards or literature prizes and, and other great notable recognitions across different fields and disciplines. And I found that not in the first 60 or 70 years, but in the last 40 or 50 years, really, there has been just an explosion of this recognition and appreciation of this vast diversity mm -hmm. of, of Asian cultures. And of course, it can be the study of language, yeah. It can, and, and, and all of these manifestations. And I think that is, you know, fortunately, it's the final point on this is that it's not about the rise of one or the decline of another, right? One of the arguments I make, and I think this is really a central, biggest argument possible, is that the rise of Asia does not mean the decline of the West. Rather, think of it like a painting, right? The world was painted by Europe one color, then painted by America another color, and now there's Asian colors. And truly, when you make a painting and you add new layers of paint, you don't actually erase the previous layers. They mix together, 
they blend together, they form something new. And that is what global civilization is today. It's still European, it's still American, and now it's also Asian in many different ways. And that is really the first time in history, we are living through the first time in history where you can say there's a global dialogue, a global conversation, mutual influences all the time. And it's not even hierarchical anymore, right? It's, you know, yes. Hollywood, but it's also TikTok, right? It, at the same time. <laughs> for better or for worse, yes. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes, well, thank you. That's, that's, that's really comprehensive and fascinating what you said. And it brings me to another point. Uh, no borders world. Can you please describe your understanding and what is your sense on how the world is being shaped in this respect with over 200 countries on the map? Well, this is a very, very important point because, you know, the, our conversations, our political discourse today is dominated by this idea that the world is fragmenting, populism, xenophobia, borders, protectionism, tribalism, and you name it, right? But in fact, the world is also more connected than ever, right? More internet access, internet cables, you know, trade, uh, de interdependency uh, in so many ways, the movement of people prior to the pandemic, all of those were also at record high levels. And so people think of these as opposites, but they're not, they're directly related. Why? Because in 1945, when World War II ended, there were only 50 countries in the world. Today, we have about 200 countries in the world. So every country, almost all countries are actually small, other than Russia and Canada and America and India and China, most countries are small. And so they actually really do depend on each other a lot for so many things. So the more division we have, the more connectivity we need. So the well, fact that the fact that we have 200 countries in the world, or if we have 500 countries in the world, doesn't mean that the world has fallen apart. It means that we will actually need each other more. And, and this is the paradox of, of my argument about the so-called borderless world. A borderless world is what you get when you have the maximum number of borders, because then your little domain, your little kingdom and my little kingdom are all the size of Singapore. And we have no choice but to connect to each oh, other so, and depend on exactly. each other. Yeah. Very so true. if you want a borderless world, and this is, again, the, the central paradox, if you want a truly borderless world, you actually need to have the maximum number of borders. And that's literally where the world is actually going. And so I, I celebrate that, actually. Well, absolutely. And it is a paradox, but it's a celebratory. But nevertheless, obviously what you just said, and I just want to have a bit of a, you know, controversy here. What you said is definitely pros. What are the cons? Well, the cons are that it can be a violent process, right? Uh, of course, you know, we look at, look at the caucuses, look at the border yeah. disputes that are happening right now in, uh, in Asia. But let's remember the big picture. You would not have the European Union today, which is relatively borderless, if you did not have the wars of the 20th century. It's because of the learning from those wars that Europe has learned to become borderless. So will the whole world become like Europe? No, actually, you know, we will not have an Asian Union. We will not have a Brussels for Europe, right? For Asia, rather. But there will be a learning process to settle each dispute, hopefully peacefully, hopefully. And as we do settle each and every boundary dispute that remains in the world, and they're really not that many, actually, right? I mean, most have been settled. Yeah. In fact, the reason we don't have many wars today is because most of the wars have happened, because most yeah. of the borders Very have true. been disputed. There may be more. It could be North Korea. It could be Taiwan. It could be between India and China. There's no question that there will be more wars. There will be more conflicts. But just remember the big picture. Every time you settle a conflict, you then move on from that conflict and the antagonists start to connect to each other again. Just look at the Balkans. You know, when I was a kid growing up, the wars of the former Yugoslavia, the genocide, the dissolution, the disintegration of Yugoslavia was the big story of most of the 1990s. But today you can get in a car, get in a train and drive around and most of yes. these countries have joined the European Union or yes. have association agreements with the European Union. 
they had to fall apart to come back together again. It's tragic. It's unfortunate. It was preventable, but we failed to prevent it. But today we are at a better place again. And that is how history actually works. Absolutely. That's very true. Well, it brings me to another point. I listened to your TED Talks and explanation based on the history opens up actually many discussions about the hierarchy and strengths of a number of countries over their neighbors. And to me, it was very interesting. How do you see the globalization and diversity impact into the cultures and human interactions? You, you touched on it just now, but can you please emphasize it one more time? Mm -hmm. I, I celebrate this aspect of globalization. And let me say that a lot of people right now are so pessimistic about globalization. You hear about deglobalization and, you know, again, retrenching of economies and nearshoring of trade and putting up borders and migration has stopped yeah. and so on. But if you think about the digital connectivity, the communication across cultures, the ability of people to learn foreign languages and, and all of the and also even global platforms that are allowing companies and coders and software programmers to work together in a borderless way in the cloud, that is obviously at record levels like never before. And in a way, the pandemic will accelerate that. Right. Yeah, so true. you Absolutely. you have your your audience and your connections, you know, all over the world. And, and so does everyone all at the same time. And so I actually think that when people talk about deglobalization, they're forgetting the entire yeah. cultural dimension, the entire global conversation. For example, we've just been hearing in the last 48 hours how the Clubhouse app was able to take off yes. among, uh, you know, those users in China who have iPhones and a VPN. So not hundreds of millions of people, but the fact that they were able to have these global, the, the Chinese diaspora was able to have a live conversation with hundreds yes. of anonymous people yes. in China about sensitive topics that wasn't censored. And that's yes. all thanks to one little baby app. Right. Incredible. So, yes. you know, we should never discount how so much of, of globalization is fundamentally about people and communication and culture. It's not about how many container ships you fill with dishwashers and put them on a ship and send them around the oceans. That's boring globalization. Right. Yeah. And it's, if you yeah, have it's that. Narrow mindedness. Yes. Yeah. If you have it, great. If you don't have it, it means that you made your dishwasher next door. Great. You're still going to have a dishwasher. It's not very interesting, right? What's interesting is how we change and influence each other globally, whether or not we have to get up and get on a plane or mail something or not. And that's the exciting part. That's the frontier yes. of globalization. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I very much agree. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, renewables and sustainability? It's obviously a very hot subject for the whole world. And is uh, Asia a leading power in these matters? Uh, yes, of course it is. I mean, you know, it, it can be. The thing is that with Asia, every problem in Asia is the biggest problem in the world, right? Because we have so many people here. Yes. So on the one hand, China leads the world in solar power and nuclear power and Japan and Korea are becoming hydrogen powers. That's great. But you still have India and Indonesia and you have the rapid industrialization of these, you know, modernizing countries. So overall... Asia is, you know, still in, at yeah. risk. It's still very dangerous. Yeah. So one of the things we need in Asia, because we have trade dialogues, financial dialogues, we have movement of peoples, all of these things are happening very constructively in Asia. However, when it comes to uh, sharing environmental best practices, transferring the technologies that can help countries to be, uh, you know, to be more efficient, to be less polluting, to be more sustainable. We have a long way to go. It's a race against time. A lot yeah. of people say the following, and it's true. Climate change will be won or lost in Asia. Is it? Oh, that's, that's interesting. Um, what compelled you to study all these issues, Barak? Oh boy, um, just traveling. <laughs> if no, I mean, there's just a one traveling. word answer. In my life, there is a one word answer to everything. And it doesn't matter what the question is, the answer is always travel. 
I mean, uh, uh, if you ask, if you ask my mom, you know my mom. Actually, you've met yes. my mother. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So my she, yes. <laughs> she says that I was almost born on a plane, you know, and uh, and it's kind of true. Uh, I guess so. Uh, I have learned just you know my whole life long that I don't um, you know sort of I don't believe anything until I've seen it with my own eyes. I, I uh, you know you you listed some of my adventures you know earlier. Um, I can't help but, you know, have that be part of my methodology, right? So to be an academic is one thing, right? I mean, it's fine. You know, you study, you read a lot, you know your frameworks, and you, you yes. know what literature to digest. But it isn't nearly enough. Time and time again, in places that I travel to, I see that reality contradicts the conventional wisdom. Yes. So for me, the single most important way to learn anything is to go and travel. Well, that's why you are a mentor to my son. That's yes, why, who's you know, himself a traveler. Yes, he worships you, know? you yes. yes <laughs> and an yes. adventurer. I will tell one little story about, about what, you know, my, what inspired me is um, the fall of the Berlin Wall. You know, um, I went to the Berlin Wall when it fell. And it was one of our family holidays. You know, we had a we had a very geopolitical sense of what holidays are. And uh, when the Berlin Wall fall, we were in New York and we got on a plane and we went straight there. And that was magical. I was 12 years old. So it was the most important moment that I have ever been yeah. through. And ever since I was 12, so it was 30 years ago, every day is sort of a derivative of that moment. You know, everything I've ever done is because I got to be in Berlin, you know, when the wall was, was falling. And, and uh, I, get, I get goosebumps 30 years later. Yeah. It was the most important thing that's ever happened to me. Yes, I remember just uh, watching it from already in Sing Singapore, and it's just, it's, yeah, it's mm -hmm. incredible. Well, what is it that you want to convey through your work to all of us? That's a great question, you know. I mean, I, I'll tell you that, you know, uh, there are people who write for an audience and they know what their readers want, right? If I'm a nonfiction writer, if I'm writing thrillers and murder mysteries, I know what my, my audience wants. I cannot say that for what I do, right? I want to convey truth. I want to convey facts and analysis. I'm in a race or a competition to simply be right, right? I want to be right. And that's not, a, that's not something that I, um, that's what I want to convey, right? But I wouldn't publish anything for you to read or anyone else to read yes. until I was 100% sure that my analysis was the correct analysis. So it's really a personal struggle. It's me yes. interpreting the world. And the world is getting more and more complex. So yes. what I try to spend all of my mental energy on is understanding and deciphering the world's complexity. And when I'm satisfied that I have analyzed it accurately, then I will publish it. And that's what I want people to absorb, right? I want people yes. to have the correct version of the story of now and the future. And that's simply it. It isn't to please anyone. It isn't to impress anyone. I yes. literally just want to be right. And that's it. That's, that actually brings me to the... Uh, world and so some of the world issues although i didn't really want to go more or much into political questions but i guess mm -hmm. uh, of course you just inspired me with what you said mm -hmm. that you want uh, to know the truth and you want to express the truth so uh, two questions with regards to the world issues first one is with regards, with regards to your experience as a geopolitical advisor to the u.s uh, special forces in iraq and afghanistan what were the challenges uh, that faced and highlighted by the operators in the midst of their mission? Well, that was a very difficult time. You know, when I was there, it was the surge, uh, uh -huh. what was known as the surge in Iraq, meaning that the insurgency had become very violent, uh, very brutal, and that more troops needed to be sent in. Um, and I was working with a particular unit uh, of special operations forces that traveled around the country and, uh, you know, they ran a lot of sensitive operations. Uh, it was very, you know, dangerous time. And it remains very dangerous in, in Iraq, even though there's fewer uh, foreign, you know, troops there. The same goes for Afghanistan, uh, which, as we know, as we're following the news today, uh, you know, it's almost 20. This, is, this year is the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 uh, terrorist attacks. 
and there are still American troops in Afghanistan. So, for example, uh, it was there was a cover of uh, Time magazine actually just before the U.S. election in November, and it showed an American soldier on the cover, and it said, you know, this this soldier was born after oh, 9/11. Yes. And that soldier was being deployed to Afghanistan, right? Yes. So it makes me feel old that I was there, you know, 10 plus uh, years ago. Uh, but, but so, the, you know, this period, it was a really instructive lesson because if you remember after 9-11, when the U.S. invaded Iraq and Afghanistan, people said, well, America is now a hyperpower. It is bestriding the world. It is a imperial colossus. And the world's unipolarity is extended, in, you know, sort of indefinitely. Instead, what I saw on the ground and what all of us experienced who were there was failure, right? Uh, you know, more or less unmitigated failure and uh, at tremendous cost economically and most of all loss of life. Uh, far more locals losing their lives than Americans losing their lives, but it was a lot of Americans too, many thousands, right? So what we saw was failure, and that's that's itself a very important lesson, quite frankly, right? Okay. So I I lived through a very very major, uh, you know, operational uh, strategic error and operational failure, and it teaches you a lot about how you should view the world. And what is power and where does power matter and what kind of power uh, and so forth. So I've definitely carried those lessons in, in, in all of my writing, because obviously you don't see me championing interventions and conflict and so forth, yes, because course. I know firsthand that it doesn't really work. Yeah. And that, of course, and people have emotional scars and will have emotional scars for life. And that brings me to another world issue, totally opposite and uh, Asian issue. What can you foresee in the situation uh, surrounding China and her growing pursuit to ensure the Chinese hegemony in the reg region of uh, this Taiwan and Hong Kong actively championing for its independence? What is your take on uh, the situation mm -hmm. right now? Well, I mean, for the foreseeable future, if not permanently, the Chinese hegemony of greater China is assured and yeah. greater China includes Hong Kong and Taiwan, you know, like it or not. Right. And that it also yeah. includes Tibet and Xinjiang, which are part of the sovereign core of the ter of territorial China. And it's too late, really, you know, uh, on, on, on most of those uh, locations, geographies, other than, than Taiwan, of course, where they will hold out for a long time. There is continuity in American policy to support Taiwanese independence. But when you talk about hegemony, that applies to a much broader geography where we're including Japan and Australia and India and Russia. There, I do not see Chinese hegemony at all. And I don't even worry about Chinese hegemony. I'm mm -hmm. very aware as much as anyone about Chinese ambition. But many people draw a straight line from ambition to hegemony. But you and I just one minute ago, were talking yeah. about American hegemony and American ambition. And yes. look what happened to that. And America is a lot more powerful <laughs> militarily than China. And look Absolutely. what it got us, right? So I think we need to pay more attention to the reactions to China, not just what China wants. Everyone knows what China wants, but no yes. one wants China to get what it wants. So to put it in terms of children in a sandbox, right, fighting over a, to a toy, there are mm -hmm. 15 children that do not want China to get the toy, right? And therefore, China will not get the toy. Yeah. And I know that it will be a painful it will be an expensive and a dangerous competition. Yes, I just hope it's not going to be a fight like it could happen in a sandbox. Right, exactly. And, but there will be little fights, right? There's, yes. look, there's been fighting with India. There's been yes. fighting. Uh, there's there's there been too. loss of life in Hong Kong. You know, yes. in, 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 uh, there are border tensions. There are significant disputes. South yeah. China Sea, Senkaku Islands. There are many, many, many skirmishes going on. When we talked earlier about, you know, what are the conflicts? How can they be settled? one by one, but it is not one big fight. It's many, many little fights. And, and yeah. I'm okay with that. I, I wish that, again, there was more maturity. Let's remember a lot of these conflicts are pre-modern, pre-legal, 
They predate 1945. They predate the United Nations. They are pre-colonial even, some of them. Uh, some of them are, that are colonial are the result of drawing a line on a map on the back of a napkin, yeah. right? Well, it, I would, yeah, this is I what would they love... knew. This is a mindset. Yes. Exactly. And I've written about this several times. I've said, you know, why don't we just take that napkin and flip it over and just draw a better line and be done with it, right? <laughs> Easier said than done. But my point is, you either take that path where you, um, you know, you, you either take that path where you, um, you know, do the pragmatic solution or you have a violent path. Um, yeah. You know, and again, so I, but either way, the big picture you asked about China, China has never dominated India. China has never dominated all of Central Asia, right? Yeah. China has never dominated all of Southeast Asia. And I have news for everyone. It never will. Right. It never will. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Parag. Well, let's move into more of, um, lighter subjects for right now for the moment. Travel. You've traveled to, you managed to visit so many destinations and communicate with people uh, around you uh, in so many countries where they, you didn't speak their languages and they didn't understand you. How did you communicate with them? Oh, well, you know, for every, uh, you know, geography or region, there's different kind of, you know, story. When I was spending um, many months in Egypt and across the Arab world from Libya, uh, across Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, uh, Iraq, and so forth. I, I spent a fair bit of time learning Arabic and, and I tried to converse and even do a couple of interviews in Arabic. It helps when I look like a local. So, you know, yeah, people were exactly. very nice to me. Um, <laughs> but, you know, Olga, whenever people ask me, what's the one language that you could have used the most uh, in the past in all of my travels? The answer is Russian. Because, huh. as you know, I'm in, I'm in love with Russia, with Central Asia. And of course, you know, the common denominator remains Russian. And so starting in the early 2000s, so for about 20 years, I've been traveling in the former Soviet republics all over many, many times. And it's such a shame to not have that comfort level to just be able to say whatever I want and easily communicate. So I've had I've had translators in China. It's no surprise, of course, that, you know, uh, one needs to have interpreters wherever wherever you go. And that helps to, you know, enrich the, the conversation. So the two kind of linguistic domains that have been most useful for me geopolitically are the ones that I don't, you know, command. Mm -hmm. But for other other places, I felt very comfortable just just, yeah. you know, speaking either like Hindi or Urdu or German or Spanish yeah. or French. And I've got I've gotten by. Well, let me tell you that you definitely can relate to Russians because you have a Russian soul. And I yeah. definitely oh, feel thank it. You. And, <laughs> thank uh, you. Seriously, what is your most favorite stand in Central Asia? You've traveled all over. What, yeah, what I mean, stands out. I, I do love all my stands uh, dearly, um, but uh, but Uzbekistan, you know, probably. You know, I, you know, so many times uh, people ask me, you know, where should I go on a holiday? You know, what's the one place I should go? And I always tell them that, you know, it's it's impossible to even speak about the Silk Road, to even utter the words Silk Road until you've gone and spent time in, yeah. in Uzbekistan, you know, and, and I've been at least 10 times, you know, probably it's, it's, uh, it's such an incredibly charming and well-preserved um, country in terms of the historical monuments. So um, each time I go, I feel like they have really committed resources to renovation and preservation, conservation of their historical monuments. And that's a wonderful thing. So it makes it really special. Uh, so whether you're listening here in Singapore or America or wherever, do go to Uzbekistan. It's incredibly safe, first of all. So for better yes. or worse, po police states are safe places to travel. So oh, I wasn't worried uh, when Mark was there to feel good. No, 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 no. I kind of felt yeah. very safe, you're right. It is, it is a genuinely special country and the feeling you get there you could perhaps only compare to iran you know quite frankly in terms mm -hmm. of again this uh this real wealth of course you know the monuments in in iran that you can still visit do go back thousands of years not just hundreds of years but when you are in uh, uzbekistan the ones that really convey the greatest historical grandeur that date back 
uh, to the era of, uh, of, of Timur and, uh, and even pre-Mongol, pre-Mongol, so less than a thousand years old. Uh, but still, it's, it's just so spectacular, truly spectacular. Well, that's definitely a great advertisement for the amazing uh, stun, for sure. Um, <laughs> children, children and family. I have known you and I, Chef, since probably basically when you arrived first to Singapore, since you first came to Singapore. Yeah. And I have always admired uh, just listening and hearing the stories about the way, the incredible sensible way of re responsibility and how you bring up the children, how you educate them, and how in a very rounded, very humble, and yet uh, certainly intense way. Can you please share your philosophy on parenthood a little bit? Or I should probably uh, write, have Aisha next to you yeah. and ask this question together, but uh, I we, have you now here. We, uh, no, I think we, we do see eye to eye on it. And I, I think a lot of the adjectives sure. you just used are, uh, are very appropriate. So, I mean, you know, so you use the word intense, but intense, you know, is not like a tiger mom. It's more intense in the sense that the kids have figured out what they like, what their projects are, what their passions are, what their entrepreneurial energy would go into. So coding, robotics, but applied to, to the real world. So each of them has just this one thing that they per, that they individually decide. They really are into it themselves. You know, they're motivated. So that's intensity. But you also mentioned, you know, humble humility. And, you know, they don't go out and like Trump. They, they actually work really hard. You know, they, they spend a lot of time learning fundamentals. And, and Aisha really emphasizes that, you know, yeah. sort of don't just make a flashy thing, really understand the code and the inside out and spend a lot of quiet time focusing on that. But also they have a lot of fun, you know, so we as a family, we have a lot of fun, like together, yes. you know, we, we obviously travel a lot, you know, so yes. for, for Zara, it's, it, he's, it's got to be 55 countries or so, and she's only, you know, 11, right? So she has, it. she's, you know, very enthusiastic about it and, you know, motivated and has written her own little book about it and right. made her own videos and everything. So, you know, we just encourage them to pick that thing. So in That's a way, it's fun. not like it's. I would say, you know, maybe if that adds up to a philosophy, fine. But I would also say that it's also it's not just inside out. It's also looking at what works in the world today and realizing that in a world where anyone has any information at their fingertips and, every, you know, technology is competing with us as humans, you want to be unique, right? There's no sense in just duplicating generic work, right? So we encourage creativity, you know, as much as anything else. So what are your key elements, what are your key thoughts on the key elements of education this day for the youth? Well, I, I, I think that what, what one would have thought even five years ago, you know, would have to be rethought today. You know, I mean, I, the, the digital dimension, the universal access to information, the disciplinary boundaries breaking down, the uh, combination of work and study simultaneously, right? Uh, so you see aspects of all of these things I just mentioned flourishing right now. So for kids that are sort of my kid's age, who are just, you know, just around 10-ish years old, um, even five years from now, things will be different. Yet again, another big step change. So I think that education really is, has the word itself almost has such a formal, you know, sort of denotation, whereas what we're really talking about is learning, right? You know, you're learning all the time. How do you digest, record, store, you know, certify that those different kinds of learning. And there's a thriving ecosystem today that's just about that process of, you know, certifying all the different kinds of learning and activities and so forth. I think that's what education really should be. This, you know, universal, all-encompassing, wherever you are, whatever you're doing. Multidimensional, I suppose. Yes. Totally multidimensional. Yes. And I celebrate that. And, and so I really do not, and this is one of the things that we muse about here at home, is sort of, you know, would our kids go to college, right, the way we went to college and spent four years at college? And I honestly hope that the answer is no. 
right? I hope the answer is no. I hope that, you know, prestigious institutions provide high quality, affordable and accessible education in critical fields to everyone. But I hope that everyone can learn those things wherever they may be. And that you, you may go to a classroom here or go to a classroom there. You may do it for half the day, but not yeah. the whole day. And that's what I want to see. And, and I think that, you know, I think that the premier institutions are adapting actually quite yeah. well to that. And therefore, I, 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 I actually think that I'll win the bet, right? I'm not really betting against anyone, actually. But my hope is that our kids will live 10 years from now the way they live today, which is that they spend a couple hours at school and a couple of hours coding and a couple of hours on a project and a couple of hours playing and then traveling and doing it here and doing it there. Why can't your whole life be like that, you know? That's true. That's why there's so much of an immersion of into different uh, learning pro processes and learning uh, subjects and fields, probably due to COVID as well. And what is your take on uh, your uh, family time and education for children during the COVID, during, during the pandemic? Well, you know, as you know, here in How Singapore, we've been, yeah, we've been extremely lucky. There were only a few weeks, I think, you know, maybe four or five weeks where they did this alternating remote learning, sometimes in, sometimes out. And it was good practice, maybe, you know, it, it definitely um, it was a, something that they'll remember. And we're lucky that our kids will be alive to remember yeah. it because we've been here. Um, so I would say that, you know, it's I can't come up with complaints because I, I almost feel guilty saying it. But, you know, as you know, we've, we've mostly benefited from the situation, you know, traveling less is good. And, uh, you know, I used to travel, um, you know, most of the time, literally most of the time I was not here. Yeah. Um, and so now I'm here most of the time. And yet life, you know, business, everything carries on as normal. So I'm quite frankly, very grateful. Uh, and if this is the new normal, that's absolutely fine with me. Especially after you travel to more than 150 countries. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I, there are only a few, well, there's no place, I had a bucket list once, you know, and it was like uh, Iran and North Korea and, and, you know, strange places, but I also went to all of them already. So yeah. now I'm just going okay. back, I'm always just going back to places, <laughs> but that's okay. Some places I'm always fascinated by and I love to see how they've changed and evolved. So, you know, I mean, in, in the next, you know, few months or year or whatever, I'll be, I'll be back uh, for sure yeah, on the I'm road. Sure, yeah. you know, there are the other Uzbeks have not can... seen the last of me. <laughs> yeah, oh, I have no doubt. And definitely no doubt. And, you know, you are very international and you lived in many countries and now you're home in Singapore for a number of years. I loved your TED talk when you state the identity of each of us that have Asian roots. What is your identity? Is it... Um, do you feel global, Asian, Singaporean? Who are you? That's the, the hardest question. You know, I'm, I'm actually writing a whole book about it. Uh, it's called Citizen of Everywhere. Um, and it's, it's partially uh, autobiographical, but I wanted to actually elevate certain figures and personalities who have been uh, role models for me through across time, those that I never even met simply because they also moved around a lot and they believed in this cosmopolitanism, you know. So yeah. I talk about everyone from uh, Jean Monnet, right, founder of the, father of the European Union. Um, and, you know, he was French, but he had a very peripatetic international career and he was simply motivated to construct institutions of peace for the whole of Europe, not just for one country, yeah. right? And I talk about you know, scholars uh, that have inspired me who also believed that, you know, you're, you should identify with wherever you are. You know, you should yeah. consider yourself, act like a citizen, even if you're not a citizen. And that's very explicit in, in my worldview, because that's really yeah. what my mentors taught me. So I would say, you yeah. know, specifically, you know, as you asked, Look, I was born in India. I'll always be Indian. I was even an Indian citizen for 15, 16 years of my life. Um, I lived in America. Obviously, I grew up in America. I think of myself as a New Yorker very much, right? Um, I also spent my childhood in the UAE. You know, with people who have this affinity for uh, Dubai and a connection, they, we call ourselves Dubaians. 
Americans, right? Um, I'm definitely a Berliner, right? Uh, not like a John F. Kennedy Berliner, like a real Berliner. Yeah. I yes. know Berlin like the back of my hand. Inside you know, up, yes. uh, I have a lot of friends there. It's really like New York to me. You know, if you put me, if you gave me a one-way ticket, said, you know, you have to go pick one place right now. You have to leave Singapore. You're never coming back. Pick one place. There's, it's totally Berlin. I, I would blurt out Berlin. I wouldn't oh even God. think. I wouldn't even think twice. I wouldn't even think at all. My subconscious and my conscious would simply, in unison, scream Berlin. It's the. It's like this, right? That is that. That is where yes, Berlin is for me. Now, it's in if your you heart. Look at, yeah. If you look at me, you would not think that that would be my answer, right? I have no biological, hereditary, or cultural um, connection. But I have lived there multiple times, and it's absolutely like home. So, you know, so when you ask, you know, I, we're Londoners, too, and we're definitely, definitely Singaporean. Uh, and I very strongly identify with Singapore, you know, in a lot of the ways that, quite frankly, you know, some people, even Singaporeans, have difficulty identifying with in terms of some of the, you know, inherited values, yes, some of the absolutely. prescriptions of the state. But now I'll put my, you know, not just my identity hat on, but my academic hat on, I have been a very strong proponent of many aspects of the Singaporean model since before I ever set foot here. I studied this country the way I study Russia, the way I study China, the way I study Brazil. You know, I study countries. That's my job. It's yes. what I've spent, you know, 30 years or whatever doing. And I have admired this place since way before I ever, ever, ever set foot here. So I coincidentally live here now, but to be Nothing absolutely is coincidental. clear, you projected this energy. So maybe, maybe you know. But the point is that that my my objective or my analytical position about Singapore predates becoming yeah. a resident and a, and a, and you know having Singapore as my home. Amazing. So so I I want to be clear that that you know I I very strongly identify with this place in ways that you know you know even if you're not you know born here ever grew up here you know it's only the last chapter of my life that i've been here but this place is obviously a huge part of my identity i can certainly feel relate to it i feel the same yeah. i've been here for a long time and mm -hmm. it is my home although yeah. of course you know i have certain and very strong feelings toward new york and st petersburg where i was born but yes yeah, singapore is home and i definitely can embrace it in full this all my soul and passion uh is there any uh, project that you wanted to venture out and haven't had a chance yet Oof, is this something you know, I, that you really have a dream of i am pursuing a couple of things i mean you know i i in my, my company we're launching we have launched uh, something called climate oases you know and we are mm -hmm. forecasting you know with uh, with data driven tools what will be the most uh, habitable geographies of the world in the future and to advocate for, uh, you know, active resettlement of people into these geographies. Um, so that's that's an entrepreneurial project. It's a, a corporate project. It's a data data science project. And I'm learning so much yeah. about, you know, math and statistics and, you know, these kinds of things. So it's really been, you know, it's, this is a nerdy answer to your question, but, you know, I've been savoring every minute of this for the past one year that we've been intensely, intensely working on it. And then writing more, writing is very painful for me because yeah. I'm very, very, no. very but bad very at thorough. it. Uh, <laughs> and, but it's a painful exercise. And, and, uh, but during this lockdown time, you know, we've just been able to be more efficient. So I've kind of, you know, finished one book, finished another book and working on another one, you know, and it's been it's been really getting these energies and getting my ideas straight. But yeah. I'll tell you to reveal to you, um, it's it's uh, television because we're working on converting my and I'm inspired directly by your son, by the way, who uh, who is who is a, a I'll real. I'll tell him. I'll pass him the message. Yeah, he knows as well as anyone how hard it is to yes. break through into this area, and we are trying to convert my next book about the future of migration and human geography into a documentary series, Amazing. and translating an idea into visuals and telling the story in advance 
to sell it to yeah. a, in a very competitive marketplace is so tough. Oh, absolutely. So when, when you say like a new project that I've wanted to do, I've wanted to do this for 20 years. And finally, the time is now We're we're working there. There's quite a team involved and we're hoping that it will, you know, get bought. And if it does, that will be for me really the next big chapter, the next big project, the next big endeavor is going to yeah. be really a very cinematic, you know, intervention. Fantastic. You should. Yeah, I'm sure. Well, uh, probably Mark knows about your project, but uh, mm. I hope you guys uh, have a long chat at one of these days. Yeah. Course. Definitely mm -hmm. something that uh, is so similar with both of you. Uh, you know, Parak, you uh, have been a very well-known name in the field of geopolitics and uh, economy, uh, and it's so important to you. Is it important to your ego? To? How important it is to be a well-known and very well-established and very admired person? Well, that's you know, a, as I that's said, a provocative question for you. Right. No, it's easy to answer because, okay. again, you know, for me, like I said before, I just want to be right. Right. And it's not that I want to be more right or less right than someone else. I just want to be right. If someone else is right, that's great. Then that makes two of us who are right. And if there's okay. 12 of us who are saying the correct things, that's even better. And there's 12 yeah. of us who are right. So the answer is I don't. I, 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 you know, you may not believe me, but I, I couldn't you. care. I, I couldn't care less what other people think that's because great. I just, if I'm right, then that's really all that matters, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. if you have an opinion about or a negative opinion about the truth, I mean, that's your problem. It's not really my problem, yeah. right? So I'm interested totally. in aligning myself with accuracy, and that's all the validation I need. It's lovely yeah. when famous people, people I admire, you know, if they write nice things about my books or whatever, that's great. That's fabulous. But yeah. if you are right, then it should not surprise you that people say good things about what you've done. So it's kind of like tautological. If I do what I am doing correctly, then those other things, the yeah. ego things, that's kind of going to follow anyway. Yeah. Do you have sometimes gut feeling about the state of economy of Singapore, Asia, or the world in general? Do you have some? Do you get any premonitions, or is it all, all what you convey and what you know is based of, on the research and the personal experiences? Right. No, so you know, in a way, it's uh, maybe it's three things, like you say, research, experience, and then the two combined, you know, do give you certain intuitions, right? You know, sort of how will a scenario play out? You know, for example, before the U.S. election, uh, people were saying America is in chaos. Um, China is going to invade Taiwan now. It's going to take advantage. Of it. I was like, my intuition was like, no. You know, I, I think I have an understanding of these things, right? A, a place gives you a vibe. People give you a vibe. And you can... Others can feel each other's vibes, and I'm feeling the collective outcome of those colliding vibes. And it says to me that no, China was not going to invade Taiwan in November of 2020, right? So that's one example. And, and I do think it's, you know, so you, you do get those premonitions and, and intuitions uh, over time. And of course, that's, that's an extremely important part mm -hmm. of what gives you confidence. You yeah. should not make all of your decisions in life or in yeah. your analysis yeah. based on a hunch, yes. right? And I obviously do not do that. Yes. But it's helpful when my, you know, sort of when my hunch is validated or when my hunch sort of confirms yes. in some way in a, in a kind of synergy, right, with, with analysis. So yes. it's maybe a spiritual approach to geopolitics. <laughs> Got it. Are you an optimist? Um, you know, some people would say that, you know, but I like to say that I'm an accidental optimist. And, and it kind of comes to the point about sort of connectivity. So I'll, I'll, I'll explain. Everyone is building connectivity and relationships and, you know, for their own influence and leverage, right? America building bases somewhere or China building pipelines, right? Everyone is doing it for their own interest. But when you piece it all together, you get this ever more hyper-connected world. 
And in that hyperconnectivity, you get resilience because you can use these pathways for trade, for movement of goods, for movement of people, and it makes us more resilient and mobile and so forth. Right. So I'm an accidental optimist because I see everyone acting really selfishly, yeah. but the collective outcome is something that benefits something, everyone. Yes. And that, that is an intrinsic argument in, in, in sort of you know, various strands of economic theory and liberal theory and, and so forth and, and globalization. But we often forget that when we only look at the trees and not the forest. So overall, I would say I'm, I'm yes, you know, I'm an optimistic person. That's wonderful. I will ask one more question from my side, sort of also, okay. I'm just curious about your answer. And then there are a whole bunch of questions that uh, a lot of our listeners posted, I probably will not be able to raise all of them, but a few of them, if you don't mind, if you're not sure. in too much of a rush, I will just scroll down for and ask a few of these questions from some of the people who are now watching our program. Um, for my side, I just, I'm curious, I want to ask you a question. What is the correlation between wanting to be wealthy and wanting to be happy? And if there is a correlation, well, there, there is some amount of research, a lot of research on this, and it, it's survey driven, obviously, and it also depends on the definition of happy. So there's a whole field, as you know, of happiness research. But even within that research, there's a lot of criticism because sometimes the word happy is confused with the word satisfaction, yes. and those mean different things. And I am actually a critic of that um, of that uh, sort of, you know, holding those synonymous. And I think we need more granular analysis of the difference between happiness and satisfaction we need to ask questions more with more precision so let me put that aside uh the the evidence that we have suggests that once people have i think 60 or sixty-five thousand dollars, you know a year of per capita income their happiness more or less is flat so if a person has sixty five thousand dollars or sixty five million dollars you don't really gain much in their self-assessment of, you know, happiness, right? But I think you would have cultural variations, right? So, you know, Singapore in some studies is considered happy. In other places, it's considered unhappy. And, I, and the difference is definitely in the difference between happiness and satisfaction. I believe, if you ask me again, anecdotally, personally, not rigorously or yeah. scientifically, I believe that Singaporeans are happy but that they're not necessarily satisfied. And it's not a bad thing to be dissatisfied. It could mean that you're ambitious and that you feel that you should push mm -hmm. more and achieve more and so forth, right? So I can attest to being maybe more happy than satisfied, right? I'm very, very, very happy. I'm too happy, <laughs> hyper happy yeah. as a person. That's but I always, I always feel you know, that when I... Only, I'm, I'm only satisfied when I push myself to the limit and, and, I, and I feel good about that, right? That's, so again, each person is different, but if yeah. you could say generalize about societies, I think it's important to note that distinction. Got it. Well, to me, you know, I think that uh, I would prefer to be happy because when you're happy, the money comes easier as well. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the way I want to look at it. Uh, Farag, there, let me ask, uh, let me try to read a few of the questions, uh, if, if you don't mind. And sure. And see how we can uh, answer it uh, in a, not a lengthy way. Uh, one person is asking, which country would be best place to raise children and the, to be global citizens? Well, Singapore, you know, there's no, no question about it. And I've done my homework about this, you know, and, uh, you know, we've lived in New York, we've lived in London, we've lived in um, uh, Dubai, in uh, Berlin, Geneva, uh, Singapore. There's just no question that this is, you know, the, okay. the city. Uh, yeah. Okay, great. Another, another question. Right uh, itself is a subjective, especially in geopolitics. What are your thoughts on it? To be right, I suppose. Right. So, first of all, it's it's an assessment of the it's an interpretation of the world today. So, for example, there are still people who argue that because the United States possesses a large nuclear arsenal and a large economy and major technology companies and the dominant reserve currency, the world is actually unipolar. Right. 
my argument is that actually simply listing a bunch of metrics doesn't tell you what power is. It's its utility that tells you what power is and how useful it is. And therefore, the world is actually quite multipolar and it's relational. And China doesn't have to have 60,000 nuclear weapons to be a superpower. So I am right. right? You don't need to listen to those. Out. There's no question there. I mean, again, people are entitled to their opinions. But if you are in the real world, not in the world of one particular theory, the, the, the argument that I was quoting earlier is basically just a, a theoretical argument. It, it has almost no uh, utility in the real world today. So as far as the real world is concerned, I'm right. So yes, of course, you know, there's the debate about subjective versus objective, but you don't find the outcome simply by counting the number of people who believe one thing and counting the number of people who believe something else. You go out in the world and you test the proposition, right? And that's how I, you know, that's where my confidence sort of derives from. Thank you. Um, another person, another friend is curious about Singapore's plan for sustainability, if, you, if there is a strong one that you know. Well, it's a, it's a great question. Let's remember that almost nothing Singapore does or does not do with respect to sustainability will have any impact on the planetary conditions because we are one of the smallest countries on earth with only yes. 5 million people. That said, every country should do whatever it can. In some areas, Singapore is doing a fair bit to protect itself, for example. Plans to raise sea barriers is one example. Uh, efforts to lower the, the temperature that is caused by the industrial output. Efforts to recycle. Efforts to generate, uh, recycle more water as well to, to limit, yeah. you know, reduce uh, water imports. Efforts to grow more food so we don't have to import as much food. Um, you know, we're bringing in, you must have seen the, the uh, it was just the Straits Times headline from about one hour ago. Teslas are now going to be available, yes. you know, for sale. So, yes. but of course, the supply chain of electric car batteries is very dirty, right? Yeah. It's horrible. Uh, so, so you know, a lot more needs to be done in Singapore. Yeah. yeah, just on basic material recycling and conservation, a lot of those things. You know, we we could do more of here, um, but I think that uh, you know the effort is starting to become more prominent, and I think that's a good thing. Thank you. And I guess perhaps the last question that I, I'm reading from uh, the feed. Do you think the virtual blurring of boundaries eventually lead to the removal of nationalistic boundaries? Ah, that's a great question. So again, we're not really removing any boundaries, right? We're adding more boundaries. We have more boundaries than ever. We have more states being created. We still have wars of secession and independence, right? So, um, so therefore, nationalism is the reason why. So if you think about, um, I have sympathies for the people of Kurdistan, right? I believe the people of Kurdistan should have their own country and eventually there will. So there is Kurdish nationalism. And so, and when the Kurds do eventually get their own country and Kurdistan gets a seat in the United Nations, there will still be Kurdistan nationalism, yeah. right? You know, France, has been an independent country for many for centuries, there is still physical French nationalism and there's American nationalism. Perhaps the only country that's powerful that doesn't have a very, very strong nationalism is Canada, right? But they're, <laughs> they're, they're unique and boring in their own lovable way. Um, so, so I hope there are we'll, not too many Canadians listening to us right now. But... <laughs> I'm a big admirer and I believe that, that that's a triumph, right? So Canada is a unique triumph in yeah. a positive way. But we'll always have nationalism. It's not evil, right? I would prefer patriotism to nationalism. You yes. need nationalism when you're fighting. And hopefully when we're done fighting and every tribe as a country, you can be more patriotic than nationalistic. Yep. And I think that would be a good outcome for the world. Well, that, that's definitely an optimist on you talking and I love it. Absolutely, yes. It is very optimistic. <laughs> yes, well, that's wonderful. Well, Barack, I can't thank you enough. It was absolute you, pleasure Olga. and thank honor you. to have you in conversation with Olga tonight. And uh, the uh, conversation, the episode will be posted uh, across the social media. I will post it on the stories and 
on the feed as well. And uh, of course, Farak, I will send you the link. So feel, feel free to share it with your admirers who, and listeners and supporters who were not able to listen to us live today. And I'm looking forward to see you very soon at our next dinner, which is in schedule. Uh, soon and uh, thank you very much love to Aisha and children and thank you so much again. Thank you Olga, and such a Pachai. pleasure. Happy, happy Lunar New Year. Kongshi Pachai. Kongshi Great Pachai. to see you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you everyone.